Hi again, everyone. This is Congressman Mike Levin. It's great to be back with you for another uh, in our virtual town hall meetings on the coronavirus. And I'm truly grateful to uh, be joined uh, as uh, we have been in past weeks by Dr. Richard Garfin of UC San Diego, who's actually joining us this week from campus uh, in his office there at UCSD. Dr. Garfin, great to see you as always, my friend. Thank you. Good to be here. Fantastic. I hope everybody weathered the storm okay. I know it was very wet in North County, San Diego, and South Orange County yesterday, uh, and I hope everybody is uh, staying safe and healthy uh, at home. Uh, for those that uh, don't know Dr. Garfin, uh, uh, we're really honored that he's here uh, once again. He uh, really is a leader uh, in uh, infectious diseases. Uh, he's a epidemiologist, uh, educator, and an innovator in healthcare. Uh, who uh, seeks to understand the causes of disease and translate that understanding into impactful solutions. Probably never more important than right now uh, to do that. He got his PhD at Johns Hopkins uh, University and his uh, MPH at San Diego State. And then he served as an epidemic intelligence service officer and epidemiologist uh, for seven years at the Centers for Disease Con uh, Control and Prevention in Atlanta before joining the UCSD, faculty, or US, UCSD School of Medicine faculty in 2005. His research focuses primarily on airborne and bloodborne infections often associated with health disparities in substance use, including tuberculosis, HIV, and viral hepatitis in the US and abroad. His research on digital adherence technology over the last decade has informed the CDC and WHO guidelines on the use of telehealth for remotely monitoring patients with tuberculosis. I have a feeling we'll be using telehealth for everything for a while. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly uh, your expertise on, on that uh, issue is very important as well. So we're so grateful that you're here as always. And over the next 90 minutes or so, we're gonna share the latest updates. And there have been a lot of updates, uh, both uh, in terms of public health and safety, as well as policy uh, and the things that we're doing in Congress. And also, as always, you can submit your questions to townhallquestions at mikelevin.org. Again, that's townhallquestions at mikelevin.org. We've got a bunch uh, for this week that we'll get to in just a minute. As always, the number one thing we can do is uh, to stay uh, healthy and safe by following the guidelines of the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the state of California, uh, our counties in San Diego and Orange County, and our cities uh, that we live in. Uh, the numbers uh, this week, uh, I've been sharing them every week, and they really are tragic uh, once again. Uh, the U.S. has the most confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the world uh, with 522,286 and now over 20,283 deaths. California, 21,616 cases and 604 deaths. San Diego County now has 1,693 cases and Orange County has 1,000 221 cases, although I would say that's probably because Orange County hasn't tested nearly as many people as San Diego County. Uh, there have been 44, 44 deaths so far in San Diego County and 18 in Orange County. The University of Washington Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, or IHME, has a model uh, that uh, many of you may have seen, uh, and it is now projecting uh, that 61,545 Americans will have died of COVID-19 by August 4th, 2020. And according to that IHME model, 1,616 of those deaths are projected to be in California. And interestingly, the peak hospital resource use is expected to be on April 13th, so just in two days uh, from now. So I, I personally believe, and we can talk more about it, Dr. Garfield, but a lot of the early measures we took in California, uh, I think were, were very wise uh, as we look back uh, and compare California's trajectory to some other states. Uh, the California Department of Public Health continues to suggest that mid-May will be the peak of the curve, so there is a bit of discrepancy there. Uh, and I speak every day with public health leaders in both San Diego and Orange counties, and uh, I do see uh, promising and encouraging signs and in, in that uh, some of our uh, social distancing and other measures uh, uh, have uh, begun to, uh, to, to show signs of promise. Uh, as we've said, uh, you know, these are not just statistics. These are human beings, each with uh, a story, a family, uh, and it's just such an unbelievable tragedy, uh, really unmatched uh, for uh, my lifetime 
Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, we've got two crises. We've got the public health crisis and the economic crisis. And our ability to really deal with the economic crisis depends on our solving the public health crisis. As I mentioned, we've done uh, now three major pieces of legislation in Congress. Uh, on March 6th, Congress passed an $8.3 billion supplemental appropriation to bolster vaccine development uh, and to uh, also uh, help with the equipment stockpiles uh, in our state and local health budgets. Clear that wasn't nearly enough. On March 18th, we passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, approximately $200 billion bill uh, that was really focused on paid sick leave uh, and emergency leave. Soon thereafter, we realized that wasn't nearly enough. And so then at the end of March, we passed the third bill, which you're probably quite familiar with, called the CARES Act, a $2.2 trillion bill. Uh, and we're already working on a fourth bill. Uh, but I, I know that the CARES Act wasn't perfect, but I do think it was a very positive and bipartisan step that we needed to take to get aid uh, to our frontline medical community, as well as to uh, American workers and their families. Uh, with regard to the CARES Act, on the public health side, $100 billion for our hospitals, of which about $30 billion is already uh, going out to hospitals in the first tranche. Uh, another $150 billion for our state and local government, of which uh, California is set to receive $15.3 billion, uh, and the County of San Diego will get $559.4 million. The County of Orange will get $534.8 million. And what we're told is that that money will start coming to state and local government on or around April 24th. Uh, for workers and their families, of course, a significant expansion in unemployment insurance uh, with uh, 600 extra dollars a week. Uh, and that makes the uh, maximum benefit under state unemployment uh, jump from about $1,800 all the way up to $4,200. Uh, in addition, if you're a gig worker or if you are a 1099 independent contractor, you will now be able to access uh, that expanded unemployment. And the expansion is for four months, um, that uh, additional $600 a week. And uh, the uh, EDD, California, Electronic, or California Employment uh, Development Department, uh, we've read and we've heard the stories about some delays there. I spoke yesterday to the uh, Secretary of Labor uh, for the state of California, uh, who assured uh, the uh, California congressional delegation that uh, the fixes are on the way, that they're working very, very hard to address these issues, and that uh, for those uh, who uh, have, have filed for unemployment, they should start to be receiving uh, the uh, expanded unemployment insurance starting early next week. Uh, and for those who are gig workers or who previously were uneligible, that might take a little longer, uh, they told us, on or around April 19th. Um, finally, the cash payments. Uh, the cash payments, of course, if you make 75000 or less, you're entitled to $1,200. Uh, every dependent is entitled to $500. And then if you make between 75000 and 100000 in the prior year, you'll get uh, some amount less than 1200 but some amount more than 600 uh, on a sliding scale. Uh, we were told by Secretary Mnuchin this past Wednesday uh, on a conference call uh, with uh, many of us in the House uh, that uh, the early kinks uh, to that system, the electronic uh, direct deposit, uh, would be going out on or around April 13th uh, for about 60 million Americans. And then uh, people will be able to go on an IRS portal, which is actually live already, uh, where they can go and apply to be direct deposit uh, for future um, uh, payments, and uh, that's if they're not currently direct deposit. And so they can sign up. I would encourage everybody to the extent that they uh, are not direct deposit with the IRS to do so right away. And if you go to irs.gov, you can uh, sign up for that portal. Uh, if for whatever reason you can't do that, you will get a paper check in the mail sometime, uh, hopefully very soon, five million checks uh, per week until all the checks have been mailed out. Uh, in addition to that, the CARES Act provided $350 billion through the Small Business Administration for what's known as the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP program. It is a, a loan program that's actually administered uh, through the roughly 3,600 lenders that already do business with the Small Business Administration. The idea is that the lender can get up to eight weeks, or excuse me, the borrower can get up to eight weeks to cover payroll and other expenses. Uh, so critically important that we try to keep our workforce uh, employed and we try to keep our businesses uh, up and afloat during this very difficult time. I'm sure everybody has seen the 
um, horrific uh, numbers for our workforce and, and now one in 10 applying for unemployment, uh, really unprecedented since uh, the Great Depression and that uh, number now roughly 13% uh, is the uh, unemployment rate, at least that's what we've been told uh, from folks like the former Fed Chair uh, Janet Yellen this past week. Uh, the, the PPP program got off to a rocky start, uh, but uh, we were again promised by Secretary Mnuchin uh, that the lenders are ready to, and, and that already the uh, Treasury Department and the Small Business Administration has approved $98 billion worth of those loans. And there's actually a lot of broad bipartisan support to add more money to that program. Uh, the discussions now are around another uh, $250 billion for that program. The final thing I'll mention about the PPP is that uh, it's intended to be forgiven. The loans are intended to be forgiven, in other words, so so long as you use them in the intended um, uh, manner and for the intended time, uh, you get those loans forgiven up to $10 million per small business or nonprofit organization uh, and you can go to the SBA's website, sba.gov, uh, to learn more about the PPP um, program. Uh, I think we need to do more with regard to hospital funding. I'd like to see another $100 billion for our hospitals. I'd like to see another $150 billion for our state and local government. And I'd like to see the restrictions uh, on cities less than 500000 from directly getting that money. I'd like to see them to be able to get that money directly as well from the federal government. Very important for cities in our district like Carlsbad and Oceanside and Vista and others that I've spoken with their mayors in recent days. Um, a few other things that I've been doing this past week with regard uh, to COVID. Uh, we introduced the COVID-19 Graduate Relief Act, which basically says if you graduate in 2020, uh, you would get uh, an extra three years of deferral on your student loans. I think that's a, a very uh, important thing given how tough the workforce is right now for people who are graduating. We've also requested uh, from Betsy DeVos additional money uh, for, uh, in addition to what's already in the FIRST CARES Act, about $31 billion. Uh, first, that that money gets expedited. Uh, two places that need it the most, like UCSD, by the way, Dr. Garfi, uh, and, and other higher education institutions, as well as K through 12. We, we need, really need to make sure that that money that's in the CARES Act gets the educational institutions that need it the most. And then second, this entire uh, COVID crisis has really uh, underscored the digital divide in the United States, where a lot of the country, you've got students that don't have access to technology, whether it be to uh, a good internet connection or uh, other resources. And so uh, I've written a letter uh, and will be requesting uh, that every child that uh, in America that needs access to the internet uh, get a Wi-Fi hotspot in the near term, get a Chromebook if they need it for their distance learning, uh, or another uh, personal um, internet device uh, so that they can learn while they're at home. In addition to that, I think long-term we're gonna need a lot more around broadband infrastructure uh, as well for those that don't have uh, internet connectivity in their homes. Um, in addition to that, I'm also leading an effort with my friend, uh, Republican Rodney Davis of Illinois to include our Prevent Family Fire Act in the next uh, bill regarding COVID. Uh, the Prevent Family Fire Act is really simple provides a, a, tax a tax credit to safe storage devices for firearms. And what we know uh, from our work with the Brady campaign and others is that when firearms are in the home and they're stored safely and locked, the risk of a gun-related accident goes down by 74%. Uh, so for everyone, uh, you know, obviously you've, you've got kids in the home uh, all over right now because kids are home from school. Please keep those uh, firearms safely stored. Uh, just the same, uh, if uh, you or anyone that you know is in any sort of crisis, you know, we, we uh, know that uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to be at home all the time. And there, there's a lot higher instance of mental health issues. Uh, there are all kinds of resources available on our website at mikelevin.org in case you're uh, in need of any support with regard to any of that. And in addition to that, we know, unfortunately, that domestic violence goes up. Um, when people are uh, isolated at home as well. Uh, there is a domestic violence hotline, 1-800-799-7233. Uh, and uh, I'll just close uh, my update uh, by uh, kind of reiterating what we've talked about as uh, the, the mantra, uh, stay in place, maintain your space, and cover your face. Those are still as true this week as they were last week, I think even more true. 
but I think things are even more restrictive this week in terms of pretty much all the beaches and parks and open spaces in our community are pretty much now closed. Uh, there is good news. Uh, again, I think locally we're doing a, a very good job, particularly with regard uh, to testing. UC San Diego has really been a leader. I was just on the phone with them the other day, and they now have about capacity for seven or 800 tests a day. Uh, and they're ramping up to about 1,500 tests a day, and that's just for UCSD. So that's great. Uh, Memorial Care up in uh, South Orange County, they're opening a new drive through uh, testing facility uh, in San Clemente at the former hospital there. So that's good. That's in addition to another drive through uh, that they've opened up in Rancho Santa or uh, Rancho Mission Viejo, the new, uh, the new uh, hospital in Rancho Mission Viejo. So that's great. And I have to give a shout out to one of our local volunteers, Louise Herbert, uh, who made the news here locally for making 600 masks hand sewn. If they have one of them right here, I got a pretty cool one, red, white, and blue right here. But very, very simple mass. She made 600 of these, if you can believe it. And I'm very grateful to her for that. And all of them, I believe, uh, have already been distributed and she's already working on more. So thank you, Louise. And, and for all the Louises out there who have worked so hard uh, to show kindness and generosity during this tough time, uh, we thank you. And uh, we need more of that uh, for sure. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Garfian for an opening statement. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, Mike. Um, thank you for having me on. So I think I'll follow up on the the idea of mask wearing for my opening today. Um, last week, the CDC announced new recommendations stating that all citizens should wear a cloth face mask when they go out in public. Um, and this can be confusing for folks, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to dissect that recommendation a little bit for listeners. So first, let's go over what the different types of masks are. Um, there's the N95 respirator masks, these filter out particles down to the size of a single virus. Um, they're used in the healthcare setting to protect workers who perform procedures that create a large quantity of these very, very small, small particles. And they're essential for, um, for physicians um, working in healthcare settings where COVID is, is highly prevalent. The next kind of a mask is the surgical mask. This is what you typically see your doctor, nurse, or dentist wearing when they um, are performing a procedure or when they come in when a patient might be sick and they're not, not um, sure what they're sick with yet. Um, these masks are good at capturing virus-containing particles from the wearer if they're infected, and they also prevent um, uh, the person who's wearing the mask from, from breathing in those larger particles. Um, the, one of the main reasons for wearing masks now is that we want to try to prevent the spread of the virus from people that are uh, either known to be in, infected or potentially infected. Um, so when they cough or sneeze, the uh, particles don't get released into the air so other people can't breathe them in. Um, and that's why when you go to the doctor uh, and you say that you have, um, you know, you think you might have the flu or you might have COVID, the first thing they do is hand you a mask and ask you to put it on and that's to protect everybody else around you. So now, then we get down to cloth masks, <clears throat> and these are these can be made from a variety of materials using one or more layers of fabric. Um, they have the ability to capture virus-containing particles, but that depends also on what the material is that they're made out of and how many layers are in in the mask. Um, and um, and there's some useful websites out there that that uh, uh, describe um, research that's been done to look at the effectiveness of different materials. Uh, that are used to make masks and in, in um, blocking particles from getting through them. So <clears throat> while these masks are um, can potentially prevent the wearer from inhaling virus that might be in the air, um, they really aren't adequate uh, as a per, um, personal protective measure um, in in say a healthcare environment. But they they can be quite effective in preventing the person who's wearing them from. Um, coughing and sneezing and spreading the virus in the air that other people might be breathing in. So um, second, the question is, well, why is the general public being told to wear these masks? Um, for one, it's because the virus can be shed from somebody who's infected for one to two days before they even start to feel sick. So people don't know that they're infected and they might be um, out in public and, and coughing and sneezing. Um, and not know that they're spreading the virus. So as a precautionary measure, <clears throat> the CDC is asking everybody to wear a mask in public, even if you don't feel sick, because 
Oftentimes people don't know that they might be infected and could be spreading the virus. So the intent is really to, to cut down on the amount of virus that might be um, uh, projected and spread around in the community. So third, why shouldn't everyone wear a surgical mask or an N95? Because as I said, these cloth masks are not as effective in preventing virus from passing through them um, as the surgical mask or the N95 mask. Well, the main reason is, is because there's just not enough of them, and we really need to reserve those personal protective equipment devices for healthcare workers, um, which is critically important because if a healthcare worker gets infected, um, they're not going to be able to perform their job, and they, they'll be out of work until they've recovered. And worse yet, they might die, and that would be tragic, and we don't want that to be happening. So we want to keep our healthcare workers safe so that they're, they're there to take care of the rest of us if we do get sick. Um, so um, what I think is really important, though, is that masks need to be worn correctly. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit about that. For one, the masks need to fit snugly around your face. And, um, and by that, I mean that when you put it on and you breathe in and out, you shouldn't feel air coming up past your eyes or around your cheeks or down around your chin. That's how you know that the mask is, is on tightly. Also, it should be a little bit hard to breathe because that's the whole point is it's trying to filter out the air that's getting to your, um, into your mouth and nose. If, it, if it's too easy to breathe through it, it probably means that it's not um, filtering enough. Um, uh, so, in, in addition, um, the fact that these masks are designed to filter out these particles, it means that the masks are becoming contaminated with these particles, whether you're breathing them out or whether you're um, um, breathing in air that's got virus in it and the virus is sticking to the outside of the mask. So we have to be really careful about not touching um, the mask because if you're trying to adjust it all the time or maybe it's hard to breathe so you're taking it off and taking a few breaths and then putting it back on, you're basically contaminating your hands, which then you could you know, touch your eyes um, or your nose or your face or touch something else that somebody else is gonna come in contact with and it's just spreading the virus. So we have to be careful that when you wear the mask, you wear it correctly, and, and as much as possible, just leave it alone. Um, <clears throat> so then the question is, well, how do, you, how do you take the mask off and put it on? Um, the point is, is that um, these masks can become contaminated and if they're doing their job, and so we want to treat them as, as if they are um, infectious material. So with the cloth mask, when you take them off, you want to put them directly into the wash or put them into a sealed plastic container until you're ready to, to wash them. And the good thing is that normal washing with detergent and hot water does a great job of inactivating the virus, so it's a great way to clean your mask and then they're ready to, to go when you um, go to put it back on again. Um, if you happen to be using the surgical masks or N95 respirators, these are not designed for reuse. Um, and so when you're done wearing one of those, you put it in the trash. Normal, the normal trash is fine. It's, you know, it's ideal if you could put it into a container that's covered and sealed so that nobody's um, touching anything inside the trash, but um, they could just be discarded uh, as normal. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I do want to caution people about is that um, with so many people wearing masks and also sometimes people are wearing gloves when they go to the market and they're out in public, there's a tendency to want to um, take them off as soon as you can and get rid of them. And so we have to be careful that we're not discarding them inappropriately, such as walking up to your car at the market, you know, before you get in the car, taking off the gloves and dropping the gloves on the ground for somebody else to have to deal with. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, we have started to see some signs of discarded masks and gloves in parking lots. And I, I just think this is this is really inappropriate and I hope people will really take that seriously that we're not just trying to protect ourselves, we're trying to protect the rest of the community by wearing masks and gloves. And so do your part to make sure that you dispose of these materials correctly. And then finally, um, my last pitch here is um, please try not to get frustrated when you hear recommendations like these changing. I know for a while people were being told, don't wear masks, now the CDC is coming out and saying, please do wear masks. And there's a reason for that. You know, health officials had to make 
the initial recommendations quickly to protect the public from a novel pathogen in the midst of a rapidly evolving epidemic. And therefore, these early recommendations were based on prior experience from past estimates of how um, these kind of outbreaks occur. Um, and unlike the SARS virus 1 epidemic, which occurred in 2002, 2003, where the spread was primarily in hospital settings, we've learned now that with SARS 2, COVID 2, um, it's really spread in the community and in households. And so that was part of the reason why the recommendations have changed. Um, and so rather than feeling frustrated by revised recommendations, try to take it as a sign of our healthcare community getting smarter and being more responsive to the new knowledge that's coming out. So I know it can be frustrating when recommendations change, but um, see it as a good thing and, and follow the recommendations and let's do the best we can to try to get through this epidemic. Thank you, Dr. Garfield. So just so I'm clear on this, for this, this cool mask that Louise made me every time that I wear it, I should put it in hot water and wash it in hot water. Yeah, uh, exactly. In the washing machine every time. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Yes, sir. All right. All right. That's very cool. Um, and thanks to Louise again. We got a ton of questions. Uh, really, really amazing uh, the the quantity. It seems like every week uh, when we do these, uh, we get more questions. So we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, first, Burgett in Rancho Mission Viejo asks, what assistance is available for retired senior citizen rental property owners who rely on the rental income for their own income? Many of us live rental payment to rental payment, very much like renters who live paycheck to paycheck. We do not qualify for unemployment benefits or cash payments available to others. Uh, I, that is quite a predicament, uh, uh, Bridget, and I get it. Uh, it's clear that we're going to have to step up and do more uh, to help folks like you. Uh, I think Governor Newsom uh, went uh, and, and I think did something that in hindsight will, will prove uh, ha a very effective and important thing uh, to uh, ban evictions uh, on a temporary basis. Um, the California Judicial Council, I know, is following up and doing that as well. Uh, I had hoped we could do something like that on the federal level, but uh, that wasn't something that um, some of our friends uh, in Congress wanted to do, and we needed a unanimous vote in order to move the third bill. Um, so what we did instead, which I think is still helpful, is we worked with all the federally backed loans uh, from things like VA and FHA and Fannie and Freddie to ensure that there was uh, forbearance, uh, at least for uh, those with those sorts of mortgages. Moreover, uh, the governor uh, worked with the big banks uh, and got them all, I think with the exception of Bank of America, got them all to do a 90 day forbearance um, now, I think, of course, uh, all these funds are eventually going to come due, uh, and uh, obviously we're going to need to do more at the federal level uh, to help. Uh, you know, I had hoped that we could negotiate some sort of direct cash payment mechanism that would help people uh, on a longer basis until we know that the worst of the economic crisis is behind us, uh, tied maybe to some metric like the gross domestic product or the unemployment rate. Ultimately, we did not do that, and what Congress passed was a one-time cash payment, but I, I think we're going to have to go back and look at uh, doing something uh, in addition to that, assuming that this uh, economic crisis continues. Um, Natasha and Cardiff asks, I fully support the government expanding the safety net and bridging our recovery from the pandemic. Second, a little more post-pandemic, please consider advocating for a rescission of the cap on deductions for mortgage interest payments in anticipation of the refinancing that will be available and beneficial to our economy. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that. That's certainly something that I would consider and I'll continue to advocate as I have even before the pandemic uh, for eliminating the cap uh, on the state and local tax deduction that was imposed during the 2017 tax bill. Uh, this would be a, a huge win for our district uh, where uh, over 40% of the district takes the state and local tax deduction on average uh, we historically have deducted about $25,000, and by capping that deduction at $10,000, it has hurt a lot of people in our district, and not just people at the top of the economic spectrum. Uh, 86,000 people uh, took the state and local tax deduction uh, last tax year that made less than $100,000 in our district. 
So my great hope is that we can uh, work to get that done as part of a future uh, stimulus bill. Uh, question for Dr. Garfine from Claudia in Oceanside. She asks, in the guidance regarding wearing face masks in public from the San Diego County Department of Public Health under the headline, how well do cloth face coverings work to prevent spread of COVID-19? It reads, and this is a quote, doctor, uh, there is limited evidence to suggest that use of cloth face coverings by the public during a pandemic could help reduce disease transmission. Their primary role is to reduce the release of infectious particles into the air when someone coughs or sneezes, including someone who has COVID-19 but feels well. She says, this sounds contradictory to me. Care to <laughs> explain that? Yeah, well, there's a lot in that question and I think I covered some of that in my introduction, but I'll just sort of reiterate here that <clears throat> at when we cough and sneeze and even when we speak and, and sing, um, virus that, that's in our uh, in our nasal pharynx can be um, shed out, you know, spread out into the air. And the idea of the of the cloth face mask is to try to capture as much of that as possible. So if the face mask is well designed, it fits well around the face, it's made of the right materials, it's thick enough that it actually can, you know, maybe have a couple layers and capture most of that material that's coming out it's really gonna cut down on the amount of virus that's gonna be circulating in the air that somebody else might breathe as they walk past you or might be sitting in the same room with you. Um, I know, you know we say that we should be six feet apart with social distancing. Um, I think that's sort of a general guideline to help us to understand you know, something concrete that we can do. Um, in some cases, the virus might not travel that far. In other cases, depending on the environmental conditions and how much somebody's huffing and puffing or coughing and sneezing, you know, it might go a little bit further. And so I think we have to use our own best judgment to know, you know, what's the probability that somebody that, that might be shedding virus next to me is going to be putting enough of it out there that I might get exposed to it. And so the face masks are really intended to really re try to reduce that. Now, that being said, like, as I said, there are other things that could make that face mask not work so well. So one is, unfortunately, I was at, um, at a market last week and every employee was, had a mask on, but, the, but they're hard to breathe through. When you're working in one all day long, they get hot, mm -hmm. they get difficult. In, and the poor cashier was taking it off, taking a few breaths, putting it back on, going back to working on the cash register, handing me my groceries, and it's, it's, it's human nature that, you know, you just do this stuff. It's like trying not to touch your face when you have an itch. We all know we shouldn't do it, but you do it anyway. So I think in order for this um, intervention to work, we have to be very conscious of how we're doing it. And if you do wear a mask, be aware that that mask now could be become contaminated and we want to treat it as contaminated material and, you know, wash it appropriately or discard of it appropriately. Don't touch it if we can avoid it. And if you do touch it, wash your hands afterwards, because if you got the virus on your hands after touching the mask, walk, you know, treat that just as if you had touched something on a grocery store shelf that might be contaminated. Wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, <clears throat> and treat it as an, as an infectious piece of material. I think if we do that and we use it correctly, the masks can be very effective in minimizing the amount of spread of, of the virus in the community. Great answer, and we thank all of our uh, grocery store uh, and other workers that are out there on the front lines of this and all the folks delivering all those groceries and all those other uh, deliveries and, and obviously all of our frontline medical professionals. Um, tough times. I know when I put the mask on, I immediately want to touch my face and I have to remind myself not to do that. Uh, and as you, you and I have said in the past, every time that you think of touching your face, you're more likely to want to touch your face. So uh, exactly. human nature. Um, Viet in San Diego has a question. What will you do to ensure this administration will conduct strict oversight of the half trillion dollar bailout we gave to large corporations, especially since many of these corporations enrich themselves at the expense of the working class? What will you do to ensure that in the future that any further or current bailouts will be repaid to the American people in full? Uh, well, first, uh, Viet, I share your concern about oversight as part of this package and um, there's been a lot that's been discussed about this, and, and from my vantage point, 
uh, when we first saw the CARES Act in its original form, uh, it didn't have very much oversight at all. Uh, and we were able to put uh, very specific provisions in there about um, prohibiting stock buybacks and dividends, as well as uh, limiting executive compensation for those companies uh, who receive the funds. Uh, in addition to that, there's a, a two-step oversight project uh, process. There's both a independent inspector general, at least it's supposed to be an independent inspector general, uh, and there's a five-person oversight committee. Uh, the inspector general that uh, was in place uh, was uh, relieved of his duties by President Trump. That was very concerning to many of us, uh, but there is another mechanism there, which is that five-person body. The five members of that body are appointed one each by Nancy Pelosi, Kevin McCarthy, Chuck Schumer, and Mitch McConnell. And then interestingly, the fifth member is jointly selected by Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. They haven't picked that fifth person yet. We're all watching and waiting to see who uh, it, it will be that they select, uh, but uh, that is an important oversight mechanism as well. And then finally, we're getting a little uh, surprise from my six-year-old here. Uh, fine. <laughs> Hello. Finally, um, in addition to all of that, uh, we created a committee. Nancy Pelosi created a committee in the House, a select committee on oversight of the pandemic uh, relief funds that uh, is chaired by Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn, of course, a senior member from South Carolina. And my hope is that that'll be a truly bipartisan effort. Uh, but I agree, we have to uh, really watch out for how these funds are spent. Uh, and uh, your, your points are well taken, Viet, and we'll, we'll definitely do all we can to stay on it, and that includes in any future uh, relief efforts. A uh, question for Dr. Garfield from Paul and Del Mar. Are takeout meals safe? And we get this a lot, don't we? Are takeout meals safe? How can we make them safer? Yeah, Paul, thanks for asking that question. I know it's been asked before, but it's a good one to touch on again because um, it's so important right now. Well, first of all, you know, eating out is actually a good way for us to support our to, to support those business owners in our community that would that are suffering right now by not having the business. So helping, you know, eating out or taking getting takeout can actually, um, you know, help keep them in business. So uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, in order to make it, to, it is safe currently, and um, but in order to make sure that it stays safe, there's some things that we can do. One is for the employers is to make sure that. If they have any employees that are feeling sick, um, they should be sent home. They should not be there working. Um, they should be at home recovering. The other thing that they should do is make sure that they're following appropriate um, uh, food handler hygiene, which means washing their hands frequently, um, handling food in a safe manner, keeping it um, from becoming contaminated with um, potentially with bacteria or viruses. Fortunately, the standard uh, restaurant hygiene that all restaurants are supposed to be following is perfectly appropriate to protect us from COVID-19. So they don't have to be doing anything different than they would normally be doing as long as they're following good um, food uh, preparation hygiene, um, the food should be safe. So then what can we do as consumers to help to protect ourselves? Um, just be aware that cooked food, uh, cooking food does kill the virus. So if you're buying hot food, it should not have um, a live virus in it. But if you're concerned when you get the food home, it doesn't hurt to reheat that food again. It could be reheated in the microwave or the oven, um, and um, that would help to kill any virus that might be in the food itself. Also consider that the containers that the food came in may have been touched by somebody um, who had virus on their hands, and so a good practice would be to take the food out of the containers when you get it home, put it into another container, and then discard those containers that you uh, purchase the food in, and then wash your hands when you're done. So, you know, if you touch the containers and contaminate your hands, wash your hands when you're finished. And then um, um, another thing you can do is remember to keep a safe distance from the person who's delivering your food. So if you're going into a, a restaurant to pick it up or that somebody's coming to your door to drop it off, just sort of be respectful of each other's space. You know, try to minimize the amount of time that you're in contact with them. Um, you know, I know we all want to sort of check in on each other and see how people are doing, but maybe this isn't the right time to have long conversations with that uh, delivery person. Let them get back to their job and stay safe, and then um, and, and they should be good. And then the last thing is try to avoid um, handling cash. 
try to use a credit card if you can. Um, even better if you can put in, uh, provide your credit card information when you place the order so that you don't have to do any sort of a financial transaction when the delivery arrives. That, um, that makes it even better. Um, but again, if you do have to have, do these transactions, um, consider that your hands might be dirty now and use a hand sanitizer when you, before you get back in your car um, or wash your hands when you're at home. It seems like this is going to be a, a boon for things like Apple Pay and, and uh, the other uh, virtual uh, payment uh, methods from your phone and so forth and uh, all sorts of, I'm sure, all sorts of interesting startups and other companies to do things without having to touch one another. No doubt. <laughs> Next question from Fran and Carlsbad. Can you explain the rationale for providing a stimulus check to individuals who, whose income has not been impacted? For example, people who have always teleworked and continue to telework out of a home office and, uh, and have not been impacted, retired or non-working individuals such as those on pensions, where their income has not been disrupted. Well, I think uh, I certainly understand and appreciate what you're saying, Fran. I think those types of cases from everything that I've seen and from the data that I've seen, those, those types of cases are generally the exception rather than the rule. Uh, I think that there are a ton of people who are really hurting uh, from this and it's just been devastating for, for working families in so many ways. You know, we, we see these numbers now with, uh, you know, another 6.6 .6 million filing for unemployment this past week. And, and as I said, an effective unemployment rate of 13% and, and likely going up uh, still. Uh, so I would rather err on the side of uh, very small minority of people that uh, are getting those funds um, and, uh, and don't need them. I think far, far more are in a position where they do, uh, but I appreciate that thought. Um, Dr. Garfian, here's a question from Jennifer, who is a, a biomed researcher at UCLA. Now don't hold that last part against her too much. Um, she asks, are we finding the stool being checked for COVID-19 more now? I am thinking a test for stool would be best. This is due to the viral shedding, staying there much longer than mucus with research I am looking at. There you go. Well, Jennifer, I'm happy to answer a question from a member of the UC family. And so thanks, <laughs> thanks for your question. Um, you know, this is an important question that needs more research. The, you know, the same technology that's used to detect a virus in somebody's nose or throat would be the same that's used to detect virus in stool. You know, it's a PCR test that's designed to detect viral RNA. Um, so that technology is already available. Uh, what I think more research is needed on is how to, is to understand how viral detection in feces correlates with the viral shedding in the nose and throat. Um, you know, are the quantities of virus that you might detect in stool um, uh, associated with sort of the stages of disease and, and the amount of shedding in, in the nose and throat, are they correlated? Um, so these studies need to be done, and maybe that's something that you and your colleagues at UCLA can work on if you haven't already started that. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that if people are getting close enough, you know, if we're concerned about viral shedding in feces is a way to transmit the infection, we should be keeping in mind that if you're close enough to somebody to be exposed to their feces, you're also close enough to be exposed to um, coughing and sneezing um, and, you know, respiratory spread. So we really have to, in that situation, be considering um, full uh, infection control precautions to all bodily fluids, and, and that would make sense. Um, Interestingly, more than a dozen groups around the world, including the U.S., Sweden, and, and the Netherlands, um, have been trying to see if the number of people with COVID in a population can be determined by measuring the quantity of the virus in sewage. Um, this has proven to be really difficult, though, because, one, we don't yet know quite um, how much virus is being shed at different stages of disease and, and whether or not everybody sheds virus in their stool if they're infected. Um, so it's been hard to predict sort of the prevalence of infection, but it can be used actually quite effectively, potentially, as a way uh, to do sentinel surveillance, meaning that if there's a community that doesn't have coronavirus yet, if you monitor the stool, you may be able to pick up that it's actually entered into that community and that it might be a community that needs um, further, um, you know, further control measures. Um, Furthermore, maybe that's a way that we can sort of figure out when coronavirus has gone away if we stop seeing it in, in sewage. 
So it's an interesting technology, important question. You know, I encourage you to do more research on it, and um, it may become a, a, a new useful tool that we can take advantage of. Plus, it can also help us to understand um, how the virus is actually impacting patients and, you know, where it's occurring in the body and what other kinds of um, health problems it could be, um, it could so, be causing. Doctor, does that mean you can you could detect it in like a wastewater uh, system? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I, I was speaking with somebody who actually is an engineer who designs wastewater treatment plants last week about this question, and I was sort of curious because I'm, I like to go in the ocean, and I was curious about whether or not the virus is going from the sewage and into the ocean. <laughs> and he pretty much assured me that the, our sewage treatment plants. Um, are highly effective at, um, at inactivating viruses and bacteria before they are released. And then when they do get released, they're pumped about three miles offshore um, so that they're not really being, that effluent isn't being dumped out into the surf line. But I think it's an important question in terms of if there is a concern about people um, going into the ocean. If, if the virus is in sewage, you know, what's the likelihood that it's still viable and can actually infect somebody who might be exposed when they're in the ocean? Really um, interesting. We, we've got some amazing wastewater treatment facilities uh, that are doing a great job. And uh, I hadn't even thought about uh, the risk this might pose to, to their workers as well. Uh, but uh, that's that's really something to, to be thinking about and, and uh, perhaps down the road, figuring out ways we can partner uh, to uh, detect uh, the presence of COVID uh, in our wastewater stream. Very interesting. Um, Ryan asks, foreign and state jurisdictions have already started discussing future immune antibody certifications, such as an immunity database tied to federally compliant driver's licenses or personal identification. That's really interesting. Um, what, house what house committee or subcommittee can take up the cause of drafting this type of mechanism nationwide? Ryan, that's a really interesting idea, uh, one that I had not given much thought to, but I think uh, what I'll do, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee would be the right committee, and Anna Eschew would be the right uh, subcommittee chair. She chairs the subcommittee on health, and I'd be happy to, to uh, talk to Anna, who's a good friend from the Bay Area, about that, because I think that's a really interesting idea. Uh, this one's for you, Dr. Garfine, uh, from Claudio in San Clemente. Is it possible that the rate of mutation of SARS-CoV-2 might circumvent our efforts to have a vaccine that works? Oof, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Claudio, that's something that, that is always a concern. So RNA viruses, like the flu and the measles viruses, are more prone to changes and mutations compared to DNA viruses, such as the herpes virus or smallpox or HPV. Um, the virus is mutating. However, uh, it was noted by a professor at Yale, John Rose, who's helping to develop a COVID vaccine, that the sequences of the original isolates from China seem to be very close to the viruses that are currently circulating in the U.S. and the rest of the world. So although mutations do occur, they don't seem to be dramatic uh, mutations in, in, um, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Also, it's important to point out that mutations don't necessarily mean that the virus is getting more infectious or more deadly. Sure, that can happen, but um, I think mutation sounds really frightening, and our first thought is, you know, oh, no, a mutation is going to turn into a monster and get even worse. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily the case, and in fact, um, uh, nearly all mutations actually make the virus work less well than before, and oftentimes those mutations mutate back um, to keep, kind of keep the virus in its uh, intact state. Um, some research done by, um, you know, a, a professor at Texas A&M um, uh, found that, um, you know, one of the things that he states is that the most common thing is that mutations appear and then die out again quickly. So another thing to consider is that <clears throat> vaccinologists, um, they're constantly looking for multiple targets on a virus. You know, where can you make an uh, antibody that would um, inactivate that virus? And there's different parts of the virus, some that are uh, more um, uh, mutable and others that are more conserved. And so when vaccine uh, developers try to make a vaccine, they try to find 
vaccines that will work on that and more conserved part of the virus, the part that doesn't change as often. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't make a, vir a vaccine against a, a virus that does mutate. So, for example, the influenza virus. Um, this virus, the most effective vaccines work by targeting the proteins on the outside of the virus that happen to change very frequently. And so uh, we can make very effective vaccines, but we have to keep making new ones every year because that virus keeps mutating and sort of and changes. And so that's why we have to revaccinate people every year. Um, however, um, other viruses like the mumps virus um, uh, is another RNA virus like coronavirus. And we have a vaccine where the same vaccine has been used for over 45 years and it's never needed to be changed. So I think that the bottom line here is that viruses do mutate, they do change, and vaccinologists um, and researchers that work on, on vaccines are aware of this, and this is part of the challenge that they have, but it's not something unusual um, about coronavirus that they haven't dealt with before, and I think that it, it's part of the equation that they work on, and, mm -hmm. and I think that um, um, with that knowledge, they'll be successful in coming up with a vaccine. That's fascinating. Thank you. I hadn't heard it explained quite that way, so it's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Roger in Oceanside asks, uh, given that they are starting to consider releasing criminals from jail if they're not violent offenders, how about releasing all the children being held by ICE to their families? That would open up lots of beds, although in subhuman conditions, that could be used for coronavirus patients and would put those children with family members who would care about their welfare rather than for-profit jails. They could also consider the release of all the other asylum seekers who are incarcerated. Uh, well, Roger, great uh, points. I, uh, before uh, this crisis, supported uh, reuniting uh, children with their families. Uh, as a parent of young kids, uh, I think you saw one of them running behind me uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes ago. Uh, I can't uh, imagine, I, I just find it entirely unconscionable that we would separate a child uh, from their parents. It just uh, is beyond my understanding that we would ever want to do that to put a, a parent or a child, uh, particularly a child in that circumstance. So I, I support, absolutely support that reunification. Uh, and we also need comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we needed it before, we're going to need it, uh, you know, and, uh, on a go forward basis. I think this is uh, going to make things more difficult for a while with regard to, to getting any sort of comprehensive immigration reform, um, but uh, we also uh, need to treat our asylum seekers with dignity and respect as well. Uh, and uh, again, things that I found uh, difficult to uh, achieve despite broad, uh, if you actually talk to members of Congress, broad bipartisan support among, among the members who want to do something. Uh, but I hope that, uh, you know, we haven't taken uh, too many uh, steps back by virtue of this virus, uh, putting up a lot of barriers. A uh, question for you, Dr. Garfine, from Eric in San Juan Capistrano. Uh, thank you and Dr. Garfine for these town halls. People are talking about the importance of flattening the curve to reduce potential exponential growth, but there is the backside of the curve that can be protracted if the curve is flattened. Well, the federal date for the end of the stay-at-home guidance nationally is 4-30-20, so the end of April, which he puts some friends likely will be extended. The risk is still great, during the downside of the curve. Why isn't anyone talking about that? Can you talk about the downside of the curve and the importance of continuing stay at home for a longer time? Yeah, Eric, that, that's a great question and I'm glad you're thinking about it and I assure you that you're not the only one. Um, I was just listening to NPR this morning and there's an epidemiologist in Alabama who's already had some great recommendations on how to deal with that. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, you know, before modern medicine, an epidemic like this would have swept through a population quickly and either killed or immunized everyone, causing the virus to run, run out of hosts and disappear. Well, um, you know, back then there wasn't international travel either, so outbreaks tended to be limited to, to the region where the pathogen first emerged, so we don't have these big pandemics. Um, well, the situation we're faced with today is that we do have um, this this pathogen, we understand it, we know how it's transmitted, um, but it is highly infectious and, it, and it's deadly. And so we're doing the best that we can 
to try to slow down the rate of transmission so that we can minimize the, the number of deaths that, that are caused by it. And if we're really successful, we might actually be able to, you know, um, eliminate the virus before everybody has to be ultimately infected with it. Um, so as, you, as Eric correctly points out, the consequences of flattening the curve or preventing all the cases from occurring at once is that cases will occur over a longer period of time, and we have to be prepared for that. Um, so what the, um, what the world is trying to do is to prevent the spread of the disease. Um, one, to keep the number of critically ill patients below the maximum capacity of our healthcare system so that all patients can be given the best possible care and a fighting chance of surviving if they do get infected. And also to give more time to researchers to finish testing potential vaccines and identify effective therapies. The goal here is to get through the pandemic with as few deaths as possible. Um, so the implications are that since many people will remain susceptible to infection, we'll have to continue to take measures to protect ourselves and each other as we ease back into life as usual. Because if we just stop what we're doing, as, you, as Eric mentioned, um, potentially a second wave could occur and infect whoever's spared from the first wave. So in terms of thinking about where do we go from here, I think we all have to uh, realize that there's going to come a time when we're going to start to ease back into things. And, and I emphasize the, the word ease back into it because this isn't something where one day we're going to wake up and somebody's going to announce that it's over and we can all go back to work. Um, life is going to be different. We're going to have to be hyper vigilant with contact tracing and so that we can detect any new cases that occur and, um, and then identify who their contacts are and try to get people into isolation to minimize the potential for further spread. Also, I think when we go back to work, we are going to be wearing masks for a while, and we are going to be um, very careful about you know, washing our hands more frequently and not touching things that might be contaminated if we do, um, you know, using hand sanitizer and washing afterwards. So I think that um, if we can sort of get a handle on this first wave and then ease back into things with uh, very consciously being aware that the virus is still in the community, that there's still susceptible people, uh, and that we have tools to, to try to slow the, the spread of the disease, we can try to keep that, that curve low, even though it might take a while to do that. And then, um, you know, hopefully we will develop, we will have a vaccine by around the end of the year. Um, hopefully we'll find that some of the treatments that are being uh, evaluated in clinical trials right now will be effective to help to minimize the amount of death that's caused by the disease, um, and, um, and then just in our daily practices, we can be more effective at trying to prevent the spread of the disease, that we'll be able to get through this um, safely and with a minimum amount of sequelae uh, on our communities. Thank you for that. Um, makes uh, really good sense. Uh, Roseanne in San Diego asks, is it the case that we got so far behind the curve with regard to manufacturing PPEs that we've been unable to catch up, or is Trump's refusal to fully implement the Production Act contributing to the shortage? Is he sitting on stockpiles? Um, well, it's, uh, it's not just PPEs uh, or PPE, personal protective equipment. It's, it's also uh, ventilators and, you know, most importantly, the, the uh, early failures around or delays around diagnostics, around um, the testing uh, that have been well documented. I, I do think um, that, you know, eventually uh, the administration got it right to invoke the Defense Production Act. I just think they did it late, and then I don't think they've invoked it to its uh, fullest extent as they need to. Uh, I am encouraged with the um, orders of ventilators from GM and Philips and others that uh, are coming online, but we're going to need more uh, PPE, you're right, we're going to need a lot more masks. Um, encouraged to see some of the discussions with 3M, although those have been slow in the making. And, uh, you know, we, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we uh, use that Defense Production Act. I, I actually co-sponsored a resolution calling on the President uh, to do that. And uh, I also wrote a letter, and I think 56 of my colleagues signed on to my letter this past week, um, that I think we're going to be if we haven't already sent it a couple days ago or yesterday, we're going to send it on Monday uh, to FEMA, uh, demanding more information about uh, some of the reports around seizures of supplies and just trying to get a sense of why they're seizing things from states, 
how they're reallocating things to other states. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, things are being done in a transparent and accountable way uh, with regard to, uh, to FEMA as well. A uh, question for you, Dr. Garfine, from Zuquette in San Diego. Uh, she writes, Spain returned to China test kit, or Spain returned to China test kits that were defective. I wonder if the USA got a similar defective batch. I don't think our defective batch of test kits were from China. <laughs> That's true. We had a few of our own. Uh, well, in that particular case, the Chinese embassy says that the Spanish government had purchased the items from an unlicensed company in China. Um, I don't know where all the labs in the U.S. are purchasing their test kits from. Um, I know that because of the demand, labs are trying to get test kits from as many places as they can. But I hope that these are reputable sources. I think what's more important is that this highlights the problem with the urgent demand for test kits and having a, a somewhat unregulated market. Um, there's a few things that go into this. So, you know, first of all, validating tests requires time and accumulation of samples from patients with known status to validate the test. Um, in order to, to, to see if a test works, you have to have, you know, a, a pool of people that, of samples from people that you know have the disease and a pool of people that that don't have the disease, and then you can sort of look at the at the performance of these different tests on known samples. Well, with a brand new disease, you know, it takes some time to sort of figure out exactly who has, um, you know, if you're God, you know who has the virus and who doesn't. But if you're not, then you have to actually have to do testing to figure that out and develop tests that can do that and then use those results to validate other tests. So this process takes some time, and unfortunately, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time, so things are being rushed through the process. Also, um, test accuracy involves two measures. One we call sensitivity, and the other one is specificity. And this is how good is the test at detecting the disease, the, the pathogen if it's there, and how good is the test at ruling out a uh, specimen if the pathogen really isn't there. And depending on what the test is used for, we might prioritize one over the other. So if you're trying to be ultra careful and make sure that you don't miss somebody, you'd want to have a very sensitive test. And if you're trying to make sure that a person really has a disease and not something different, you might want to test that errs on the side of being more specific. So different tests are designed with these different considerations in mind, and that, that can affect, you know, how, how those tests perform. Um, and then also test performance can differ from lab to lab based on in, you know, the environmental conditions, you can take the same test and put it in two different labs and it might perform differently depending on the, the environmental conditions, the training of the technician who's running the, the test, how complicated the test is. So these things um, can also affect how these tests perform, perform um, in practice. Um, and then, um, you know, so the bottom line here is that um, the more the scientific community works together and shares the findings of these uh, results and having companies so that the companies that are manufacturing the test can produce the best possible test, the, the better off we're all going to be in, in having tests that we can rely on to give us accurate results. What I have read, uh, Doctor, is that, uh, you know, obviously the, the nations that have the earliest and most widespread testing have done the best. Uh, and we were pretty late in that, um, you know, the CDC test had problems uh, and that the uh, commercial and clinical labs uh, were delayed in their rollout because the FDA uh, was slow to grant emergency use authorization to a number of them. You combine those two things and we were kind of, um, you know, we, we, uh, we really were, were late to the game by probably four to six weeks with regard to getting those tests that we needed and we haven't really caught up you know in terms of uh, the tests that we've got distributed per uh, million population I think we're among the worst uh, still of all uh, major industrialized countries uh, and it's concerning because until we get the testing uh, really rapidly deployed widely available um, you know we're, we're, it's going to be very hard uh, to, uh, to, to figure a, a scenario we can go to an effective containment a strategy from everything that I've read. So like Scott Gottlieb, who was President Trump's FDA commissioner, has rolled out a pretty comprehensive strategy. And, and he said just yesterday from something I saw that 
We're going to need on the order of uh, half a million tests a day uh, in time uh, to be able to, you know, including the test people who are asymptomatic. They're going to need those antibody tests as well. And of course, Dr. Fauci briefed us uh, multiple times this past week on all that. And we're going to need both from everything that I've heard. Uh, and we're going to need it soon, very soon. We, need, we really need it. Uh, Ami Berra, who's a doctor, who's a really good friend of mine, congressman from Sacramento area, said, look, we need a national testing strategy. We've got a number of states that have a testing strategy. We've not got a number of companies that have a testing strategy. We've got a number of hospitals that have a testing strategy. We need a comprehensive, coordinated, effective federal testing strategy. And what we do in Congress is we allocate lots of money for things, but it's going to take leadership from the respective agencies, from the administration, to have a coordinated and effective national testing strategy. And we need it, we need it right away. Um, yeah, Congress, I have to just to add on to that. I, I have to agree there. I think that's that's crucially important. There's it's sort of a it's sort of a careful balance here because on the one hand we need testing. It's a very important tool for us to help to understand who's infected and who's not, who needs to be protected, who's already protected. And um, and so that testing is vitally important. But on the other hand, the results of those tests, if they're inaccurate, can actually cause some harm a, as well um, in misdiagnosing people, but also in terms of really getting the, the case counts right. Because if the test isn't accurate, we could be undercounting or overcounting cases. And so in understanding the dynamics of the, of the pandemic, we want to try to make sure that we have the most accurate results. So I think your point about trying to coordinate those efforts and figuring out what's the, the most effective test, what's the most accurate, getting the resources behind um, the development of, of those technologies and getting those technologies into the hands of the, of the labs and the healthcare providers so that they can do the best possible testing is crucial. And I think we need that kind of leadership to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can and getting the resources out there where they're needed. Thank you for that. Uh, Jun Tao in Capistrano Beach asks, I'm wondering how this will affect the election, both for primaries in general. Is there any way to vote by mail? Well, in California, yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, good news on that front. Uh, and, you know, it's a top priority for me. I, I, I've been a proponent of vote by mail before the pandemic. Uh, I think now more than ever, we saw what happened in Wisconsin. Um, it's unconscionable to me that you would have people out there risking their health in order to exercise uh, their right to vote. Uh, I, uh, I don't wanna see a repeat of that anywhere across the United States. Uh, that's not what we stand for. And you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, there's absolutely no evidence uh, of widespread fraud as the president has alleged in states that vote by mail. The data simply does not support that assertion. Uh, on the contrary, California, I think uh, our elections are uh, well run uh, and I think they'll continue to be. Uh, we do have a special election coming up in May uh, for the one of my um, uh, congressional uh, districts to the, to the north, one of our neighbors to the north in Los Angeles for the 25th. I think it's on May 12th and that will be an all vote by mail special election for the order of Governor Newsom. Uh, and I think California, we're better prepared in California than a lot of the country with regard to vote by mail, but I'd like to see more money in a future bill uh, to help secretaries of state prepare for this. Um, you know, I, I worry that, uh, you know, uh, different states will handle it differently and uh, not always do what's in the uh, best interest of public health, which I think has to come first. A uh, question for Dr. Garfine from Teresa, who is a physician's assistant in Encinitas. Dr. Garfine, please comment on what sort of COVID-19 testing is of the highest quality. We are learning that some of the quickly developed tests are showing false negative results. I hadn't heard that before, so that's interesting. We're obviously all holding our finger or crossing our fingers with regard to the Abbott test. What do you say, doctor? Well, there's there's different kinds of tests. There's the test that's looking for the virus, and then there's a, the newer tests are looking for antibodies against the virus. And they're really sort of measuring different things. The the viral test is looking to see if the if the patient actually has the virus in their in their body and is actively sick. The antibody test um, 
is used to tell whether or not the person has been exposed to the virus and is producing antibodies against it. Um, those antibodies could be present while the person still is, infe is infected and infectious, um, but they also remain long after the person has recovered from the disease. And so they're good for knowing who's already had the disease, um, maybe not quite as good at, at knowing um, who is currently infectious. That's where the viral test is, is beneficial. Um, but we're in this period where so many tests have been developed very, very rapidly, and they're trying to be put on the market so that labs can start to use them. And so um, the normal FDA approval process has been sped up. And so when it comes to which test is best, the specifications of the various tests are normally included in the, you know, in the package insert with the test, and you can look and you can see the, the evidence that was used to evaluate the test, and you can look at the sensitivities and specificities and the performance of those tests. Um, however, the FDA has been compelled to give test emergency use authorization, which is a step below FDA approval. Um, here's where the FDA hasn't uh, required that the test be validated in the same way, but they um, seem to be good enough that they could be used while those tests are being conducted. And so the data on the accuracy of these tests um, is not quite as available as they normally would be with FDA-approved tests. That information is being accumulated and we'll know better over time how well these tests perform, um, but it's, it's, it's a little unclear at this point to say, like, what's the best test? But in terms of the question about false negative results, um, some of the problem could be that the virus, which targets cells in the lungs, might not always be present in the nose or the, or the throat, which is where we get the sample from to do the viral, load, uh, the viral test. Um, also, the quantity, sometimes referred to as the titer of the virus, can vary depending on the severity of illness and also the stage of the disease, whether it's you know early versus late in the person's course of disease. So depending on when you actually do the test, the ability to detect virus in the person's nose and throat can, can change. So it's possible that you know if a person's being tested late in the course of, of disease, by that time there's not as much virus in their nose and throat, it might come up negative even though the person is clearly sick with with COVID, and you can you know, tell that by a chest x-ray and by their symptoms. Um, and so that, that would be a false negative test. Also, it could be that if somebody's being tested very early, um, there might not be enough virus in the sample to be able to detect it, um, and so it could come up negative, even though the person might eventually uh, uh, develop full-blown disease. Um, so uh, it, it's possible that you can have these false negatives. It does happen. Um, it, some of that's based on just how the test is tuned. Some of them are designed, you know, to test down to a certain threshold, and below that they can't, you know, they can't detect very, very small amounts of the virus. Um, and so the, the test dynamics can have something to do with that. Thank you for that. But we're not necessarily seeing any uh, greater uh, false negative percentage or anything like that with the rapid tests than we did with the, uh, the, the other tests, are we? Well, I think that the when tests are, are put into market, they're usually designed to be at least as good, if not better, than what's already out there. So <laughs> I doubt that we're like That's rushing the to get worse tests out than the ones that we currently have. That's certainly the hope, right? That's certainly the hope. Yes. Uh, a, a question from a small business owner in Carlsbad. Why are the banks determining who gets the loans? Seems like the policies are different at each bank. Uh, well, that's a good question. That's not how it's, I, I assume you're referring to the, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is okay. administered by the SBA, but is run by the banks in, in the sense that they're the direct interface with the customer. Um, you know, I think the reason that uh, the program was designed that way was from a capacity standpoint. If millions and millions and millions of small businesses are trying to apply for these loans, that the SBA is not as big of an agency as you might think. It's only about a billion dollar agency. So I think the belief was that the existing lenders would have the capacity to be able to handle the volume quickly. Uh, however, some of them have done a very poor job of handling the volume. Others have done a great job. And, um, you know, particularly the community banks and the credit unions. Um, the, the lenders themselves are not supposed to do anything but 
uh, administer the, the program as it's intended to be administered by the SBA and is authorized by Congress. Uh, so the same terms and, con and conditions would apply, the same um, covenants, the same uh, uh, payment terms, is the same interest rate of 1% interest would apply across the board. What could be different per bank is uh, eligibility. So some banks have tried to restrict eligibility to only their existing customers. Uh, and, you know, Wells Fargo is the largest small, bin, uh, small business lender in the United States, and they arbitrarily set a cap of $10 billion on uh, their lending under this program. Uh, that was related to their overall asset cap that was mandated uh, as part of uh, a recent settlement uh, due to some past malfeasance by the bank. Uh, but we have lifted that uh, temporarily for, for this program. Uh, and so now they're able to basically lend as much as they like. My daughter's back, by the way. They can't see you, though. This is Elizabeth, everybody. There she is. I don't know if Jeremy can see this or not, but uh, do you like homeschooling? Yes, she does. All right. I love it. It's beautiful. Picture of us. It's very nice. Probably hard to see, but it's very cute. Um, so, Hi. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, the last thing I'll say about this. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you, sweetie. Um, future future uh, artist, current artist. But uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, when he briefed us uh, Wednesday, uh, he told us that uh, he was also frustrated that SBA was taking so long to get this program out there, um, and that uh, about $98 billion of the money had already been lent uh, or was already approved. But you're, you're absolutely right. We've got to be better. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to need more money for that program on top of it. So uh, very cognizant of that. Uh, and I'm, look, for everybody out there that's struggling and that is waiting on whether it be on their um, EDD, uh, state EDD, to get it together with regard to the unemployment insurance, whether it be waiting on the Treasury Department or the IRS with regard to the, the cash payment, uh, or a small business waiting on the SBA and the banks to get together with regard to the PPP, I hear you. I understand it. I'm equally frustrated by it. And we are working to pressure them to move as quickly as they possibly can uh, to implement the law that we passed. Uh, and they need to get it done. They need to get it done right away. Um, Dr. Garfine, this is from Matt in Del Mar. What physical characteristics do patients that require hospitalization have in common versus infected people who don't require hospitalization? It's a great question. So that is a good question. So most people with COVID-19 can write out the illness at home um, and treat it similar to the flu with rest, plenty of liquids, some over-the-counter medications to help reduce fever and cough um, make, and, and to be more comfortable. The main reason that patients are hospitalized is because their lungs are unable to effectively oxygenate their blood. And so when that happens, it's important that the patient get into the hospital so that they can be supported um, until, they're, until they can recover. And so signs of uh, needing to be hospitalized would include things like shortness of breath and extreme tiredness. So the fever, the cough, the body aches, you know, that could be managed at home, but when a patient gets to the point where they're having difficulty breathing um, and, and along with that would come extreme tiredness because they're, they're not giving enough oxygen, um, that's when they really need to be in a hospital where they can be managed. They may also have other underlying health conditions which can be exacerbated by the disease and so there might be other reasons to hospitalize a patient um, which could be very important. And so. Um, anyone who has COVID um, should be in touch with their, with their healthcare provider, and um, as they are recovering or progressing with the disease, they should um, talk to their doctor if they're having any concerns and, and let the doctor make the determination of whether or not the patient needs to get, get in and be potentially hospitalized. Certainly, if a patient has, um, is experiencing shortness of breath, it's, it's critical that they get health care right away. And so if you can't get a hold of your doctor, call 911 and, um, and get, the, get the care you need. But in terms of which symptoms would indicate the need for hospitalization, um, for the most part, patients should be able to recover at home. 
Um, but when you're really having that difficulty with breathing um, and, and oxygen in your blood, that's where it's critically important to get that support from, a, from the hospital. Thank you uh, for that, Dr. Garfin. Um, next question comes from uh, Susan in Encinitas. This is a great question. Why can't we use South Korea's test for COVID-19 rather than wait to develop various tests? I, I got to tell you, I kind of wondered that myself because the first case identified in the United States, domestic case, was identified the same day, I believe it was January 25th or 26th, as the first domestic case in South Korea. South Korea started testing 100,000, 200,000, 300, 400,000. We were behind, you know, we were at 80,000, something like that. And we, we really have never, on a percentage of our population basis, we've never caught up. So why can't we, uh, can you explain that a bit, how this all works and how this got all messed up? Yeah, you know, I wish I was in the business of selling tests right now because I think <laughs> You know, I can't, I can't say why we're not using that Korean test. I mean, maybe we're using the same type of technology that was developed in Korea to, um, to create tests that we're producing here in the U.S. You know, there's 7.8 billion people on the planet, and right now everybody, every one of them should potentially be tested. So there's, there's more of a demand for test kits than there are actual test kits. So it's possible that um, maybe South Korea um, doesn't have enough test kits to sell to the United States. I don't know, um, but there are, are um, certainly uh, numerous providers right now that are trying to take the technology that's being used and produce tests. You know, there's, um, there's patents on this technology, and it's not like you could just take somebody else's technology and, and um, produce tests, so I think that it's a complicated business. Um, I, I know in the U.S., um, the labs here are trying as hard as they can to acquire test kits and reagents. Um, in some cases, they're developing their own in their labs, and um, everybody's trying to increase that capacity. The other thing that's important to know about um, running tests is that, um, that the, the test itself requires some equipment to run it on. Some of them, um, you know, the antibody tests that will be coming out will be a small standalone device that you put a drop of blood in, and you can have a result in 10 or 15 minutes. Those will be great tests. But the test for the virus is a more complicated test. It requires more equipment. And in some cases, a laboratory, a small lab, might only have an, uh, the equipment to run one or two of those a day. Um, and if you're all of a sudden talking about ramping up testing to doing you know, tens to hundreds of tests a day, you need more equipment. and. Um, uh, and more staff to be able to, to run those. So it's a, a matter of the technology uh, and the test kits and the reagents, but also all the other um, infrastructure that's necessary to be able to ramp up that amount of testing. So Very good. I don't know about this Korean test, but I think <laughs> that uh, I think we should be trying to get test kits from wherever we can right now. Well, and I guarantee you, doctor, that Congress is going to take a hard look at how we can improve upon the situation in the future because we will have future uh, needs for new kinds of tests, you know, as, as we have new uh, viruses that, uh, uh, that we learn about. Um, John in Carlsbad, and this is another interesting one. He asks, now masks are recommended. Why can't the government help us get non-N95 masks? That is a great question, and I had actually read something yesterday about how the Trump administration was thinking about, uh, you know, making masks available across the United States, and, and they recognized what a difficult logistical challenge that would be, and they eventually withdrew from that, um, that uh, uh, national uh, mandate to, to, to pr provide those masks. Uh, but you're right. We, we sent billions and billions and billions of dollars in various bills to the strategic national stockpile. And what we learned very early in this process, we were briefed, oh, probably uh, mid-February, the late February by Vice President Pence when we were back in Washington uh, before the second bill. So it's probably late February. And one of the things that was pretty striking is how few masks and ventilators and PPE we had in our strategic national stockpile. And um, I think we really need to understand why that was, and we need to fix that problem. 
Um, Alyssa Slotkin, one of my great colleagues from the state of Michigan, she has a background at the Department uh, of uh, Defense, and she has actually said that the Department of Defense might be better than HHS to run the strategic national stockpile. I think that's an interesting idea that we're going to have to explore. Uh, but, uh, John, it, it's frustrating to no end that we uh, have a mandate for masks, but we don't have masks for people uh, that can be provided. Uh, but uh, what we do have, uh, fortunately, uh, are good folks in the community like Louise who make hundreds of them, but also you can make them at home uh, pretty easily. And there's about a zillion different uh, do, it your, do it yourself, do it at home uh, uh, directions for how you make a mask pretty easily. And I think it's probably easier to do a mask at home than it is to cut your hair at home. I haven't, uh, I haven't figured out the whole home haircutting thing yet. We're going to have to delve into that one of these days, doctor. Me either. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to this. I'm not looking forward to this. Um, all right. Question for Dr. Garfney from Barbara in Oceanside and a similar one from Roseanne on Facebook. Do you need a doctor's recommendation or referral for the drive up testing centers? Who qualifies for testing now at UCSD? Yeah, this is a really interesting concept of the drive-up testing. So the idea behind the drive-up testing is not necessarily to make it available to anybody that wants a test. It's really in, it's a, a way to get the testing done outside of the clinic setting to really sort of maintain the social distancing. Um, if patients drive up in their car, they um, can provide a sample right there on the spot and then stay in their car until the results are ready. It uh, minimizes the amount of contact with a lot of people being tested in waiting rooms. And so um, right now, the, from what I understand and what I've, I've read online is that most of these drive-up testing sites require that the, the person being tested first um, go through a battery of questions and then have a doctor determine that they're at risk and they should get tested. Um, I, I don't think that there, at this point, are any places where somebody could just drive up at random and say, I want to get a test and be tested. That's not the way they're designed. Um, UCSD does have a drive-up testing center. Um, I think that the majority of the testing that's being done is for um, healthcare workers and people that are um, suspected to have COVID-19. Um, some of the conditions that would be used to determine if somebody should be tested um, at one of these drive-up testing centers would things, be things like age of 65 years and older, having severe symptoms, uh, having immunocompromised, uh, immunocompromised condition, having some underlying medical conditions, um, or our healthcare workers. So if you're interested in, um, in being tested and you're thinking about one of these drive-up testing centers, um, I recommend you go online and you look them up. I actually found that there's a national site that uh, lists out every place in the country where there's drive-up testing and provides information about um, what you need to do to be tested. And there's even a, a, a link that you can go to to get that um, to, to get the doctor's recommendation recommendation to be tested. Um, hmm. But I, uh, what I'm hoping is is that at some point when we have more of the antibody tests available and we have an ample supply of tests, then there will be more of the ability for people who are concerned and want to be tested that they'll, they'll be able to take advantage of these um, resources as well. But for right now, as far as I know, you need to have a doctor's recommendation to be tested. And so um, uh, that's the way to start. And then they would direct you to one of these drive up testing centers. Doctor, if you could send us that link, uh, we'll get it up. We have a great uh, resource page at mikelem.org. And thank you, Hunter, if you're watching, for uh, helping to put the links up, and Adam uh, and others for uh, your, your good work on that uh, page. Um, next question from Sunny in Oceanside. Uh, Sunny asks, we have our bank info on file with the IRS and have filed our 2019 taxes already. We received a refund for 2019. Do we have to apply for the free money that is coming to individuals, or is the IRS doing this automatically? Um, well, if the IRS has your banking information uh, and you otherwise meet those requirements that I mentioned before, so the income uh, cap, uh, then you'll you'll get the assistance uh, automatically via direct deposit, and that ought to be done on or around the 13th. 
the last thing I'll say, I, I hate the term free money because it's definitely not free. Uh, when we're done with this, we're, our, our national debt is going to be somewhere between 28, 29, 30 trillion dollars. And our GDP, uh, to debt and our GDP to deficit ratio will be unlike anything we've seen since World War II, maybe even worse. The projection I saw today was 13% deficit uh, to, to GDP for 2020. Uh, and uh, we're going to have to figure out, obviously, in the near term, we've got to do this to stabilize our economy and to defeat this uh, public health uh, crisis. But we've also uh, got to be mindful that in the future, we can't um, continue to carry these kinds of uh, uh, deficit to GDP ratios in the future. We've got to get things back on track from a fiscal standpoint. Um, question from Julian in Dana Point. Is it possible that we already had COVID cases here in California back in January or even earlier, but without testing, we just don't know? Other countries were already taking aggressive action in January with widespread testing and national lockdowns. We're now facing an explosion in cases in the U.S. Could this have been prevented? And I'll start with you, Dr. Garfine. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the first death in California occurred on March 4th, and that was um, only the 11th death in the United States and one of the 53 patients that were um, had confirmed COVID in, uh, in the state of California. Um, since the pandemic occurred during flu season, it's possible that there were some transmissions that were occurring in the community before doctors really had COVID-19 on their radar. So yes, it, it's definitely possible that that was happening. Um, I think looking back at other uh, epidemics like um, the first SARS, which happened in China, and then the um, Middle Eastern Respiratory Symptom uh, Syndrome virus, the MERS virus, which happened in the Middle East, um, we sort of watched how it took some time for those viruses to spread around the world. COVID-19 or COVID really seemed to have spread much more rapidly. And so I think um, the world was sort of watching and waiting and not necessarily without justification. And so it's possible with air transportation, some people had come over from China, they were mixing in populations in California and other um, states where there's a lot of um, um, migration between the, the two countries where um, there could have been little outbreaks and they weren't recognized because of the fact that it was occurring during the flu season. And those mm -hmm. symptoms are very similar and doctors might have just thought that they were severe flu. So it is possible. But the one thing I would like to say is that um, I feel like our state of California has been doing a really good job in being proactive, more proactive than other states around the country. And in fact, last week, Dr. Burks um, used California as an example and during one of the um, press conferences with the president saying that California was doing things right. So even if we didn't necessarily start as early as we could have, and I think there's lots of reasons why that didn't happen, I think we, we've done a good job since then in making sure that we're being proactive and, and we're uh, responding appropriately. Thank you for that. Another question for you from Robin in San Clemente and Faye in Del Mar. I think they had similar uh, questions. Is there testing or testing being developed to see if people have already had coronavirus and gotten over it? I think my family member had coronavirus a few months ago. I think we know the answer to, the, to that is yes, but I'll let you answer in a second. And she says, uh, I want to know this because I think people who already had it would then know they're safe to go out. Very true. Yeah, yeah. So like many other uh, viral infections, after the virus is cause the infection, our bodies try to fight it off by producing antibodies. Some of those antibodies are there uh, for the short period to try to get the initial, um, the initial uh, jump on the virus. Those are referred to as IgG, or excuse me, IgM class antibodies. Um, they're sort of first to arrive, but they don't stick around that long. And then the, um, our immune system produces other antibodies that are what we call the IgG class antibodies. And these tend to um, stick around longer. And also, we have immune cells that are primed. So the next time that um, they see that virus again, they'll start generating more of these IgG class antibodies. And those are the antibodies that um, are effective in fighting the virus and preventing a, a new infection from occurring. 
Um, so when we develop vaccines, those vaccines are designed to um, uh, prime immune cells so that when they're, they're, are, we're exposed to the virus, our immune system will generate lots of these antibodies to fight against the virus and prevent infection. So there is actually a test. It was produced um, produced by a company called Celex, and it's an IgG IgM rapid antibody test. And this is a nice, very simple test where you put a drop of blood in it and you wait a few minutes and you can see whether or not um, the IgG and the IgM antibodies are, are there. And what's kind of nice about that combination is that um, if you see the IgM antibodies, you know that that person has been infected recently. And then the IgG antibodies come up a little bit later and they last longer. So you can sort of use that combination of the two different types of antibodies to see where a person is in terms of their infection. But I think what's in, what um, is important and relevant to the um, to Robin's um, and Faye's question is, can you use that test to tell you who's already been infected and who's now immune? And yes, that, that would be the case. If somebody has those IgG antibodies um, and they've recovered from the illness, the presumption is, is that for at least a period of time, and we, it'll take some time to determine how long they last, but at least in, for the short term, those people are immune and won't be reinfected and so they could potentially go back to work and they can um, um, be exposed without having to worry about being infected. Um, it's still too early to say how long those antibodies last and how long the protection is. You know, we'll only know that with time. But for now, I think that's a really good indicator that, um, uh, that, that we can use to, just to know who's been infected and who hasn't. Could you speak, I guess, related to that, my own curiosity on this. So, so obviously we're going to have widespread testing, hopefully very soon. But in the months ahead, can you speak to how we'll use the combination of hopefully a widely available antibody test with a more widely available um, standard uh, COVID test uh, to try to move from mitigation to containment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we're, if we're looking at the larger population, we could use these antibody tests um, in a number of ways. One, from an epidemiologic perspective, if you want to know how, how much the uh, infection has circulated within the community, you can test people to find out who's already been infected and who hasn't, and we can kind of get a sense of how widespread the, the infection has been. Um, you could also use that test to, to know um, who's already been infected and so who's not, who's no longer at risk of becoming infected. Those are the mm -hmm. people that can go back to work, like healthcare providers, which would be very, very useful to know. And you can also use it to figure out who's still susceptible and who needs to be protected so that they don't become infected. And they would also potentially be, you know, ideal targets for vaccination programs. So right. the vaccine is online and we need to know who to give it to and there's not enough to give one dose to everybody on the planet. You know, a test like this can help to to, um, to know who should be first in line to be vaccinated. Excellent, excellent. Uh, that's all really helpful. Let's hope that we get there very quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. So one more for you from Richard, uh, or for Richard, from Lori in San Clemente. For people who have recovered from COVID and have antibodies, can their antibodies be reproduced in the lab to treat patients suffering from COVID, or even as a preventative for others who are not infected? Yeah, that's a great question, Laurie. We call that convalescent plasma therapy. And what that means is that people who have had the infection and have recovered um, presumably have a large amount of these protective antibodies circulating in their blood. And if, um, and if those people donate their plasma and the plasma is processed, um, those antibodies can be injected into a patient who is either currently sick or potentially um, maybe exposed and hasn't become sick yet as a way to protect those, those patients. Um, so it kind of gives them a boost of antibodies before their body has had a chance to produce enough of their own to, per, to fight off the infection. And that was commonly, that's been used in the past for other diseases like hepatitis A and B. There's something people might have heard of, of um, immune globulin or gamma globulin, um, which was 
can be given to somebody who's been exposed to the hepatitis A virus, maybe as part of a foodborne outbreak. They know they've been infected. You can give them some of the um, um, plasma before they become sick and it'll pre prevent infection. So um, in theory, this should work. And so there's some research studies being done right now, some clinical trials evaluating it. UCSD is actually involved in one of these trials um, with the hope that it will actually work. So we know that you can concentrate um, antibodies and you can, um, you can transfuse those into other patients. The question is, is it effective and are there any adverse uh, effects from doing so? So we don't want to just start doing this willy-nilly without actually evaluating it. We want to know that it works and it's safe before um, recommending it routinely. But it is, it is being worked on, and it's a great idea. Really, really good stuff. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, Chris and San Clemente, we'll make this the last question because we're over uh, time. And, and again, I want to thank uh, everybody for, uh, I, I'm looking at the, the stream of all these questions. I thank Ellen uh, Montanari for, for reading them all and for getting them in the queue for uh, for next week, and uh, we'll keep uh, doing that. And also, you can send them online as well uh, or via email. Um, Chris and San Clemente asks, thanks as usual for being so accessible. Has there been any discussion involving putting the Defense Logistics Agency in charge of distributing PPE, ventilators, tests, et cetera, to hotspots across the country? My understanding is this DOD agency is uniquely suited to fulfill this national need, especially compared to FEMA and state governments. Can Congress push the issue by allocating funds to the agency? Um, Chris, that's pretty much what I was talking about before where my colleague, uh, Alyssa Slotkin from Michigan, uh, has offered up that bill that would put uh, the stockpile in the, hand of the DO in the hands of the DOD. And I think it's a really uh, worthwhile idea to explore. Uh, obviously, there were some big shortcomings and continue to be big shortcomings with how the stockpile is being handled. So we wanna do all we can to address that. Uh, and with that, I think we are through our questions and out of time for this week. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for watching and for all the outstanding questions. Uh, I do know that uh, we're going to get through this uh, collectively. Uh, I'm so incredibly impressed, as I've said, by all the kindness and the generosity uh, in our community during this incredibly difficult time. I know everybody that is watching this is following those guidelines. Uh, and we've got to encourage all of our friends and family members and neighbors to do the same. I'm truly grateful to our team, uh, everybody uh, from uh, Adam and Hunter and Ellen, uh, working so hard out there, uh, compiling the right uh, data and, and making sure it's readily available on our website. Uh, if people have any questions or need any assistance at all, I really encourage you to visit uh, our website or to contact our office, of course, and we'll do everything we can uh, to be helpful. Uh, I wanna thank our amazing volunteers as well who have continued to uh, act uh, in our community uh, in a sense of service and selflessness as we just make sure that uh, we're all doing okay out there. Uh, we're all in this together. And of course, I've gotta thank you, Dr. Garfield, for just being a remarkable resource and uh, for spending uh, some of your quality time with us each and every week and just know uh, that we're all pulling for you to uh, be able to uh, figure all of this out with the rest of your week, uh, the epidemiology and, and figure out how we can all work together to best address this and, and all uh, future um, viruses as well. Uh, but uh, I'm also mindful of how tough this time is for everyone, particularly those of you who are waiting uh, on uh, uh, assistance, whether it's unemployment assistance from the California EDD, whether it's the uh, small business programs, uh, the paycheck protection program, or uh, whether it's a direct cash payment, uh, just know that uh, I do sincerely believe that in the next week or so, hopefully we'll have this next week, uh, same time, same channel, and a lot of you will have already received your uh, unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, many of you will, will have received your cash payments, and I hope even some of you that have applied for the small business loans will have received those uh, as well. So with that, Dr. Garfine, any, uh, any final words of wisdom for this week? Keep washing your hands and cover your face. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will do it. I guarantee All you. Right. Well, I want to, again, uh, thank uh, my family. Uh, this will be the first uh, Easter and Passover weekend ever that I haven't been able to spend with my parents. And if they're watching, I love you guys and I miss you. At least I've seen you like this, but I mean, I miss being in the same 
uh, physically in the same place with you. And, and this would be a very strange uh, Easter weekend to not be with my mom. And it was a strange Passover to not be with my dad. Many of you know my dad is Jewish. My mom uh, is Mexican-American and uh, very strange to not be with them uh, during this time. Um, and, uh, you know, what can I say? We're going to get through this time. Uh, let's all try as best we can uh, to uh, just be there for one another. And I look forward to seeing you all same place, same channel next week. Thanks again.